ask you this question, how was your last week? You look fresh, amen? And that's exactly what I'm talking about today. Amen, let's read some scriptures from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. This is, in essence, the summary of, of the message today. And uh, it goes like this, God's promise, God's promise of entering His rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. Listen to this very good. This is extremely interesting passage. For this good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them, talking about Israelites. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only we who believe can enter his rest. Are you with me so far? Yeah. As for the others, God said, in my anger I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. Even though this rest has been ready since he made the world. Talking about Adam and Eve, seventh day God rested. And it says here, we know it is old. it is ready because of the place in the scriptures where it mentions the seventh day, right from the beginning of creation. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work, but in the other passage, God said, they will never enter my rest. So God's rest is there for people to enter, but those who first heard this good news failed to enter because they disobeyed God. So God set another time for entering the rest. So Israelites failed to enter the rest. He sets another time for them to enter the rest. And that time is today. God announced this through David much later in the world's already quoted. Today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Now if Joshua had succeeded in giving them this rest, God would not have spoken about another day of rest still to come. Referring to the promised land. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labor. Just as God did after creating the world. And I finish with this scripture. So let us do our best. To enter that rest. But if we disobey. And I repeat. But if we disobey. As the people of Israel did, we will fail. We will fall. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we just want to thank you for this moment, for this place where we are today. And Lord God, I pray that you will minister to your people this morning. Father, speak to us through your word has been prepared in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, I've got a very simple, straightforward message today. I want to talk to us about rest and the title of my message is the Lord your God will give you rest from all your enemies Amen. so turn to somebody next to you and tell them the Lord your God will give you rest from all your enemies and that's what I want to talk about today and there are three things in this title number one he wants to give us rest, so we've got to establish what exactly is rest. Is it just a day off and have coffee and tea and whatever, or chocolates, lay in the bed and, you know, put some shows on and, and spend the day? What exactly is rest? Secondly, I want to discuss who are our enemies, right? Some of you may have physical enemies, but uh, uh, some, there, there are spiritual enemies that we face every single day of our lives. And thirdly, how is it going to be? Do I have to play any part in achieving this rest of God? Amen? So the concept of rest as we discussed already started very, from the very beginning in the book of Genesis when God created and said, on the seventh day he rested from all his labor. Now, did God really need to rest? I mean, Jesus said, well, I see my father and he's always at work. But he was making a point. He was making a statement of a rest to come for the entire world. When he began the creation,
creation, he made a mark and he made a statement and he knew what was to come and he said there will be a day of rest. There will be a time when he will enter this rest of mind that I'm talking about and referring to as the seventh day. But Adam and Eve did not have to rest. Remember, they were already in the paradise in a way. They were already in the rest of God. Yet before they fell and sinned, God said, there's a day of rest. Right? They did not have to rest. He didn't tell them, Adam, by the way, um, this is the order of the world and these are the days, in, as you know, and on the seventh day it will be a holy day for you guys. But nothing of such sort was said to Adam and Eve because they were already in the rest of God. Amen? Then I want to discuss the rest, the concept of rest that is for human beings and then there's a concept of rest that is for the land in itself. Leviticus 25 verses 1 to 4 it says, While Moses was on Mount Sinai, the Lord said to him, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you have entered the land, I am giving you the land itself must observe a Sabbath rest. So first God spoke to, to, to humankind and, and he made an ordinance indirectly, which Adam and Eve did not have to follow at that time because they had not fallen into sin yet. But then there is a rest that is alluded and talked about the land in itself. And it says the land in itself must observe a Sabbath rest before the Lord every seventh year. For six years you may plant your fields and prune your vineyards and harvest your crops. But during the seventh year the land must have a Sabbath year of rest. It is the Lord's Sabbath. Do not plant your fields or prune your wind plants during that year. No man, we will not practice and we as Christians do not practice that exactly the same. But I just want you to think about this principle of giving the land itself a rest. So isn't that correct then? In other words, when we talk about this physical principle in spiritual language, that you've got to store time to time some ministries that you you're going to stop time to time and give land the rest from sowing and harvesting and everything else. So isn't that correct in terms of what we are doing as Holy Nation Church, that we're taking a rest from everything that we do, talking about it spiritually. Because I know some of us are, are like workaholics, some of us are machines, especially this man over here. I did not point anyone, I don't know, it could be any one of them here. Um, he's wearing a suit, you know. Um, could even take you to hospital with him because of exhaustion of works. But this is this is this is interesting. In the same passage, verses six to seven, he says, "But you may eat whatever the land produces on its own." So you could still be harvesting while you're in the time of rest. So there still be fruitfulness from the ministries that have happened already, and you could be reaping that reward. Amen? Amen? God works in mysterious ways. He says, take a break, take a rest, but you can still reap. This applies to you, your male, female servants, hard workers, and temporary residents who live with you. Your livestock and the wild animals in your land will be also allowed to eat whatever the land produces. Moreover, than taking this concept of rest further, I'm just taking you on a journey with me, so stay with me. Because we've got to establish what exactly the rest is and why God puts so much emphasis on this right from the very beginning. And this is something that somehow we tend to undermine. And don't think about oh, this. Yeah, well, day off. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm feeling all right. I don't need a day off. I was talking to someone uh, yesterday, a good friend of mine. And he said that uh, due to the exhaustion of work, and he's a busy man. He, he one day just felt sick, couldn't breathe. He had to call it a day and go home. Go on antibiotics and, and whatever and drink soup and everything. He said, this is it. So I don't care. Life's more important to me. But that's physical rest. That's physical rest. 
And then God forms this even in part of the Ten Commandments. You shall keep the Sabbath day holy. Amen. But a lot of us, like I said already, we find it hard to comprehend and embrace. We were doing a clip with Pastor Jackie and she used this word in this clip that about rest week. That I, I hope that you've been able to embrace this. And, and I seriously think that I really hope and I pray as well that we've been able to embrace this. But this isn't something that everybody wants to embrace. But this is a God-given mandate, a structure that runs right from the beginning of the creation till the end, till we actually enter the rest of God. Amen? Amen. You know, we would like to, even in the ministry circles, like I already said, if, if we had our way, we would work, work, and just work. But there's so much desire and passion for the lost. There's so much desire and passion for, for doing ministry and helping people and holding people's hand and doing whatever we can. There's so much in us that we want to give all of us. We want to give all of us into all the things that we are doing. But for this very reason, God said, I want you to enter my rest. Well, can, can, can I say this without, you know, saying this in, a, in any disrespectful manner? But when we try to say things like that, you know, I, I want to do more, I want to achieve this, I want to go there, I don't want to take a break, I want to I wanna do whatever I can, don't worry about the rest for me. Can I say one thing? What perhaps I'm indirectly trying to say when I'm saying those things is that, that it depends on me. Is that right? Yeah. Do you agree or do you don't agree? Yeah. You don't have to. But I just feel that's what sometimes we make a statement that it depends on me. If I don't do this, even when I'm supposed to be taking rest, if I don't do this, it's not going to happen. And I'm going to show some scriptures for us to establish that even further. Now, we know the story of, of the provision of manna. In Exodus chapter 16, and I just want to read from, from verses 27 onwards, but I just want to paraphrase that story. God said, take, take the manna every day. Um, by afternoon, it started rotting. And on the sixth day, you take it for two days. Okay? But by Monday, the, the, the Sunday provision will not last. That will also rot. Somehow, divinely. But God gave it to them. Right? Well, look at this. Nevertheless, verse 27, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it. But they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and instructions? Now let me ask you this question. Which instruction specifically God is talking about here? Yeah. Keeping the Sabbath holy, not going out there and working out that day, He's provided for you Rely on that provision. It's going to last for the next day as well. Don't worry about it. Take a break. Don't go out there and look for manna. I've got it for you already. It's not going to roll. I know it rolls every single day. But on the sixth day, it's not going to roll. Trust me, God is saying. It's not going to go wrong for you. But some people did not believe that. They said they're going to go out. Because it depends on them going out and bringing the income in. It depends on them going out and uh, have that sorted out. Bear in mind, in verse 29, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day, He gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day. No one is to go out. So people rested on the seventh day. Now, I just want to uh, invite somebody in a moment um, to share a small testimony with us. But before person comes, I want to share my testimony. A few years ago, I was working as a, as a, a CS a customer services assistant in, in a retail store. Um, and I progressed and I became department manager and then suddenly the company structure changed. So no more department managers, only three managers in the entire store. We don't need people in between, no supervisors and stuff. Just people working and three managers, that's it. Everyone else, take your redundancy, take the money, walk out, or 
uh, you can apply it for a lower place, or a lower position. Um, just become an assistant, shelf filler, or whatever. I was uh, offered a tendency, a few thousand pounds. Um, but then came another condition with that. So if you take a tendency, you can't apply for even the, the, the lower position for the next six months, because we're giving you money. Um, but after, but at the same time, if you take a tendency, you can go for a test to be a trading manager, um, which is quite a hectic test. It lasts over four days. You go for different assessments, different people, different places, different scenarios and everything. And uh, I said, all right, I'm going to take the money and I'm going to apply for this test. And uh, I applied, I took the money, I applied for the test. Results came, I scored quite high. They offered me the job to be a trading manager. I said, great, brilliant, God, you're so good. You know, I thank you, Lord. But um, with that came the condition. As a manager, you've got to work four, at least two or four Sundays on four weeks rota basis. Now I said, well, this is good salary, it's good position, it's good staff under you and everything, but I said to them, no, thanks. I don't want to work because I can't work on Sundays. I've got to go to church. This statement went throughout the region of about 200 stores. The regional director himself called me and said, are you, are you in your right mind? <laughs> because this is, this is the opportunity. People are in queue to get this. And you've got this and you want to turn this down. I said, yeah. And somebody said to me, from the soul, they said, look, look, for God, you want to just leave the job? I said, no, 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 no. You're telling me, leave God for this job? I said, that's not going to happen. I said, I'll, I'll go to Sunday. I said, take the job, no worry. I still remember I came and I met Pastor Mike on a Sunday. He said, well, you've done the right thing. Obviously, he has to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at that time, I wasn't engaged to Misha. I wasn't going out. If I was, maybe he might have given me a different advice. So listen, man, I understand. We'll pray about it. Just take the job. You know, you've got a wife, especially my daughter. You know, look after the house. Look, things will happen. You know, maybe. It's all right. It's not worry. I would not have said that. It's not me to work it, same. We can repeat the verse now. Um, so, I came with prayer. They said, you've done the right thing. On Monday, I started talking to my They said, can you do one Sunday? He said, even then, just commit to it. I'll cover you, but just sign the document. I said, I'm not signing anything. I don't want to work even one Sunday. Keep the job. It's all right. No hard feelings. Two days later, the regional uh, manager called. who oversees everything. And uh, they said to me, we've got a situation in a store in Tottenham um, where there's this guy and he's just as crazy as you are. He wants to take every Saturday off. He was seven day rent as well. <laughs> and he doesn't want to take the job on. Do you have an issue working on Saturdays? I said, I have no issues working on Saturday. I will work every single Saturday, but give me Sundays off. They said, okay, we're going to put you in that store. That guy wants Saturday off. You want Sunday off. And that's how it's going to work out. And previously, I had actually applied to work for a transfer for that store, and they said there is no vacancy here. And it was very close to my home, and I wasn't there. But God honored. When you put it first, when you keep the Sabbath holy, He will honor you. The most vital aspect of keeping the Sabbath holy for the Israelites was to come before the Lord. Some of us want to keep the Sabbath holy by relaxing. Some want to keep the Sabbath holy by being at home. But real meaning of keeping the Sabbath holy is to honor God with your presence in His presence. Amen. Amen. Is to bring yourself before Him and present and thank Him. And then when we do that physically, He promises that He will give you rest from all your enemies. Amen. When we do that physical aspect, the spiritual rest starts to flow. Amen. And God starts to honor you. I was talking this morning earlier on in the car. I said to them, I said, one thing I want to just say to you guys who are traveling with me in the car, never miss a Sunday. Be stubborn about it. 
Be stubborn about it. Say, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not going to miss Sunday at any cost. No matter what. Even if I'm sick, I'm going to call the ambulance, tell them to drop to church. That's fine. We'll start our own ambulance services, all right? Which will bring you to church, right? So we want, we want to have that stubbornness. And I tell you, when you're stubborn for God, God will be stubborn for you. He will not let the enemy come close to you. And he will give you rest from all your enemies. Because you are focusing and concentrating on him. And he takes pride in that. There's something, I can't explain this. But my life explains this for the last 15 years. I can still come on one hand that the day of I might have taken for something unforeseen that happened from church, except being on missions in the last 15 years. I think this is something honorable, something so beautiful when we put everything aside. Our shopping trips, our relative trips, our meetings and greetings, our holidays even. So say this, and say, well, I want to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. <coughs> Business meetings, work meetings, I want to be in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to invite uh, my sister-in-law to come and share her testimony recently of what she's gone through. So I want to just share it from her and I want us all to hear from her. Um, you can have the other mic as well. She's just going to share how she's put her job on the line as well because she did not want to, to work on Sundays as well. Guys. So about six months ago, um, there came up a job at the hospital that I work at so that I wouldn't have to work any Sundays. Because until that point, similar to Vicky, we had to work two Sundays a month, um, either nights or days. So there was quite a lot of Sundays that I was away from church. Um, and this job offer came up at the hospital to work no Sundays, only work weekdays. But it was a lot less money than what I was currently earning. Um, but, you know, me and Sheldon, we talked about it and we decided, you know what, let's go for it. It's better that I have the weekends and I'm able to come to church, just take the job with the less money. We'll work it out, don't worry. Um, so I've done that for six months. I've been working a job, a bit less money, able to come to church. And two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I went for a job interview at one of the top private schools in London. And I got the job. I only work five days a week, normal hours. Um, I get all my Sundays off, and it's more money than the job that I was originally working. So in all situations, if you put God first and just give him the time that he asks for and put your faith in him, you'll always get rewarded and he'll never leave you down. And there are many more testimonies, I believe, sitting here today. That you put things online for God. And God will honor you. So we left a job and found a better job even for more money. Amen? But money is not an issue, but God's able to honor us even with that. So we see throughout the Old Testament, right from the beginning, there's that Sabbath day rest. Leviticus 23 3 says, You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but on the Sabbath day is the Sabbath of complete rest, an official day for holy assembly. An official day for what? A holy assembly. What is a holy assembly? The gathering together. Ecclesia. Yeah. It's the Lord's Sabbath day and it must be observed wherever you live. And then going forward, then there's the, the land which was promised to the Israelites. And God said, I'm going to give you rest from all your enemies when you come to the promised land. He says in Deuteronomy 12, 10, But you will soon cross the Jordan River and live in the land of the Lord your God has given you, when he gives you rest from all your enemies, and you're living safely in the land. Second Samuel 7, 10 to 11, it says, I will provide a homeland for my people Israel, planting them in a secure place where they will never be disturbed. Evil nations won't oppress them as they have done in the past. Starting from the time I appoint judges to rule my people Israel, I will give you rest from all your enemies. 
So there's the physical rest appearing before the Lord, and the Lord is then taking it further and he's saying there's the promised land rest, where you're going to have the emotional rest, where you're going to have the rest for your souls, where the concept of rest goes even further. Where God is saying now, look, you, you, you felt that the rest has so far, but don't worry, I'm going to give you the promised land and you're going to have rest. But I tell you what, they still fail. And that is why in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 10 to 11 it says, So I was angry with them and I said, Their hearts always turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. One thing was to rest. So in my anger, I took an oath. They will never, ever enter my place of rest. We don't want God to take that oath against us. I don't want God to take that oath against me. I don't want God to make that statement. Against this man, I'm not going to let him in. Because he dishonors me. We continue on a daily basis have to understand that there is that rest, spiritual rest, that God has prepared for us. Rest that we practice here as a divine spiritual meaning to it and that is the rest to come for eternity in heaven and God is preparing us for that so that concept Pastor Jackie, isn't just limited for us to get rest here it is to push that further and understand that there is a rest to come and if you can't practice that now how are you going to be able to embrace it in heaven and if you Ever read, heard about Sandika Sori Pasma gave me this recommendation? The guy who went to heaven, people who, who lacked on such things, they had to prepare themselves before they could enter into the throne room of God. They had to be on the outskirts. But we continually face battles. And that's the second part I want us to understand. Now that we understand what this rest really is, that it isn't just for our bodies, but it is also for our emotions. It is also for our soul. And then it is also for our spirit, for eternity. You with me? So far? So body, soul, and then for the spirit for eternity. That's exactly why God is so concerned about us so we understand the three dimensions of rest. If you can allow your body to be rested, your soul's going to be rested. And if your soul's going to be at rest, your spirit's going to be at rest forever, for eternity in heaven. Amen. That's why he's so much concerned that we got this, and we understand this. But there are enemies that we face, who won't allow us to rest. Is that right? Who are those enemies? And that's what I want to just go through with us. One of the enemies that we face, it's fear. The rational fears, the irrational fears, we face fear as one of the strongest enemy who disables us to get rest. We are fearful what will happen if my job is not secure. What will happen if I don't have money? The fear of the unknown. What will happen if, if, if I lose my job? What will happen if I don't get my visa sorted out? What will happen with my children? What will happen with my marriage? I'm going to work on this. I can't be at rest because there is a constant battle with fear in our lives. Fear leads to stress, which is a great enemy. Works unknowingly in hidden, in hidden ways. Stress is the feeling of being under too much mental or emotional pressure. Pressure turns into stress when you feel unable to go. Stress can affect you both emotionally, physically, and it can affect the way we behave. Life in London is as stressful as it can get. I tell you, there is a spirit of stress in London. There's a smell of stress in London. And if you're half sensitive to the spirit of God, you will sense it the moment your plane lands back in London. You will sense it the moment you drive back into the borders of London. You will sense it. I've sensed it. 
There's a swell of sense, uh, stress all over people in London. And it affects us. And God wants to disable that enemy from our lives. He wants to give us rest from the sphere of stress. Stress leads to all sorts of addictions. Substance addictions, drinking habits, alcohol to escape that stress and be in a place where you just, oh man, I just, I just, want, I just want a break. Let me just grab a glass. Let me just have this time to myself. Ask me if someone you don't have to say yes. <laughs> but that's what happens. Habits of, of binge watching movies and TVs and, and habitual things that just, you just want to get your mind off. Because you're so stressed. Anything that takes place of God to deal with these things is an idol for us. It's an addiction. And that cannot be in our lives. If the first place is not the word of God, if first place is not God, if first place is not the presence of God, and first place becomes something else, my friends, we've got problem. We've got problem. Frictions will, will make you waste your money, will make you waste your time, and takes you away from the presence of God and, and having that allegiance with God alone. Anxiety, depression, you know, the next, the next. You're not really coping with stress. You try to cope with, with measures which are momentary, but they don't really work because the problem is still there. And then suddenly the stress mounts up to become anxiety. Yeah? It mounts up to become depression. And depression is a killer. It leads you to isolation. It will lead you to suicidal spirit. When you don't want to talk to people, I'm depressed now. Relationships get affected. Families get affected. Marriages get affected. Church commitments get affected. Ministry gets affected. Everything gets affected because this enemy doesn't want you to rest. But God wants to give you rest from all your enemies this morning. Hallelujah. He wants to give you rest from all of these enemies of ours. You see, we find to, to find solutions in all the wrong places. Let me go for a Swedish one today. Let me go for a deep fishing. Let me go for, for a Thai one. I think I've tried the Thai one before. Underwater massage. And then it's great if you want to relax from, from a long, tired, building, construction type of work. You know, that's okay. But I tell you, they can deal with your body, but no reflexology can deal with your soul. Only the Spirit of God can heal and give you rest in your souls. Only God is able to bring rest to your souls. You are dealing continually, physically, with the rest that your body needs. But really, the rest that we are seeking is the emotional and the soul and the spiritual rest that only God is able to give to us. No deep tissue can heal that. No matter how deep it is, no matter how much pressure is put on the body, it is not going to go away. Because only God can bring rest to our souls. And the good news is that He wants to give it to you. Antidepressants is not going to help. They're only going to suppress the pain and suppress the, the ways that are in your mind to make you forget for time being. I've got a doctor at the back noting, praise the Lord. Stress, fear, anxiety, all of those things. God is only able to give us rest. Then there are other enemies that we face. Poverty. Spirit of poverty. Spirit of death. Some, of course, are, are issues of, of physical nature and on our spiritual lives. If we've been unfaithful in handling it, our finances in the wrong way. Credit cards, shopping sprees, you know, are not correct. Money in your debit card shopping sprees are absolutely fine. But make sure you take your husband's permission. <laughs> Unless your husband has to take permission from you. 
Somebody pray. <laughs> but these, these also are our enemies. And all I said is God wants to give you rest from the enemy of death. He wants to bring rest in your finances. You see, if, if money is one of those things that is the greatest and the strongest motivator of our life. The way we live, think about it, is, is very much controlled by where our income is coming from. Am I right? Yes. Money comes first sometimes. Well, I've got to think about my job. But I tell you, when you move in house, you've got to think about your church first. You want to move as close as to your church, not as far as from your church. Some people move as close as to their workplace. I'm going to get to work. Sicknesses and illnesses, of course we know. Sometimes demonic attacks just happen. Instead of living a full life, we spend more time dealing with sickness and illnesses. Continual attacks. Of course, there are medical reasons for certain things. But stress, anxiety, trauma, fear, all of these things will, will eventually lead us even to being sick. Because they don't want us to be at rest. God wants your soul, your emotion, the real you, to be at rest. But these things are not allowing you to be at rest. Am I talking to someone this morning? And this isn't, this isn't how God intended for us all. I want to say this, that all the people sitting here this morning, this isn't the lifestyle God wants us to have. Amen? Amen. This is not what God intends for you and for me. It isn't the way God perceives you. It isn't the way God wants you to struggle with your life. It is the enemies that do not want us to rest. But God wants to give you rest from all your enemies. But these things keep coming back. And somehow we've, we've got this idea that this is normal. Somehow we've, we've sort of understood that, you know, everyone goes through stress. Yeah, everyone's got to have a little drink here and then. Everyone goes through these things. You know, this, this can happen because you live in a busy city. You live in a busy environment. Life is demanding. It's okay. It's all right. But this isn't the normal state of human beings. This isn't the way God created you to be. And especially for those who are in Christ Jesus, things have to reverse. Amen. We cannot, as a church, we cannot, as the people of God, we cannot be struggling with these things. I'm honest. I need this. You need this as much as I do. We all need this together. We have got to say and come to a conclusion and say, enough is enough. This isn't who I am. Why am I stressed? Why am I under constant pressure? Why is this thing affecting me more than anyone else? This is not you, church. This isn't who God wants us to be. It's not normal. For a Christian, born again, spiritual believer, to be under anxiety and depression, then what is the difference between me and an outsider? What is it that going to set me apart? If I've got to be like the people outside there, then what's, the, what's the big deal then? If I've got to find solutions in all the wrong things, then what is the big deal about this? So how is God going to do this, is my last point. So we establish what rest is. That isn't just body, but it's motion, soul, spirit. We establish that there are enemies that he wants to give us rest from, but how is he going to do it? That's what I want to discuss. And then we're going to pray today in this place. Amen. Christ offers the ultimate rest. See, the word rest, the Sabbath, was repeatedly explained and told to Israelites, but they failed. They failed to enter God's rest. And this is why Jesus stood up, and this is the word of the year for us as a church, and that's why I'm preaching this message. 
And this is how God does it. Simple, straightforward. You know, make a note. You may not even need to because you know this already. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. Then Jesus said, Come to me, oh, you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. Anyone weary and carrying heavy burdens this morning? And I will give you rest. And this is how he says he's going to do it. Take my yoke upon you. Now don't switch off. I know it's a well known verse. Please don't switch off. Take my yoke upon you is the solution. Because I'm humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your bodies. For souls. You'll find rest for your souls. See, we've got to take this deeper. We've got to take this and understand that it isn't just a physical rest. It isn't a reflexology treatment. It isn't something that I come and I feel the weight's lifted off my shoulders. I feel so fresh. I'm great, good to go for the next week. But if the issues, anxiety, depression, stress, fear, all of those things are still existing in our life, you've not found rest. I haven't found rest. I haven't. I have not been able to enter the rest of God. I have not been able to do it. If I've been in and out of the church the next day, I'm, I'm still concerned. And there's still things which I've got to sort out. I've not done it. I fail. To take King his joke upon us is, is something that we've really got to understand. But to understand, we've got to understand what a joke is. And I, don't wanna, I know some of you are thinking, I know what you're going to say now. You're right. You know what I'm going to say now. Yoke is a, a heavy burden which is put between two animals, mainly oxen or horses or mules sometimes. And they're put together to, to pull a weight that one party couldn't do on their own. Right? But it also has a job. And the job is to keep the other animal in sync with the other animal. So if we've got to take the yoke upon Christ for ourselves, the question is, am I following his footsteps? Now let me say this. Jesus says to people, come. I'm going to give you rest. Take my yoke. Yoke, by any meaning or definition, is not a sign of rest. Yeah. Did you know that? Yeah. It isn't a sign of rest. He's inviting you to work. You get me? Yeah. He's inviting you to work. He said, come. The, the correct thing would have been, he's going to say, well, come, or why have you labor and later, come. I'm going to break this yoke and only breaks the yoke and size there. I'm going to break the yoke. And go free. You're free. Free. Full of the Spirit. Free. But you say, no, 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 no. You won't rest. The real rest, come to me and take my yoke. But then he does that and say, but my burden is easy and it's light. And I'm gentle and humble in spirit. Learn from me. So the biggest question I want to ask, not whether you understand what a yoke is. And I'm sure some people here can, can give me a better explanation than I've just given you about what a yoke is. But the question I want to ask is this. Do you really have the yoke of Jesus Christ in your life? Are you really in sync with his words? Are you really taking the step as the oxen will do together? Are you really understanding when situation arises with marriages, when situation arises with children, when things happen in household, when things go wrong, do you know where Christ wants you to go? Or are you in complete unrest and are seeking the answers in all the wrong places? Are you really doing what Jesus would want you to do? You know, as young children, sometimes in, in Sunday school, they, they have this phrase, what would Jesus do? You know, what would Jesus do? WWJ, what would Jesus do? I want to ask you, if you've got his yoke upon you yourself, that would be the thing that you would be asking. What would Jesus do in this situation? Unless we have his yoke upon us and understand 
And I, I, I just want to say that I don't have the full explanation on this. Because for everyone it's different. That's why I, I understand for myself. But I can't, I can't. You've got to understand for yourself. You've got to see and ask God, God, Lord God, what is your joke upon me that is different to somebody else? Because yours is different from the person sitting next to you. Everyone's at a different pace, speed, and state of life. Amen? Everyone's got their other issues that are different from somebody else. But instead of being yoked to Christ, we yoke ourselves in all the wrong places. We yoke ourselves in, in with, with guilt and condemnations that we can't break from. We yoke ourselves to sin. In dealing with the mess that we create, sometimes we create further mess. See, yokes are heavy, they are burdensome, and they, they can easily be identified if I have a yoke upon myself. So I just want to ask you right now, we're going to pray soon. Just, just do some reality check with me this morning. I'm speaking to myself as much as I'm speaking to everyone here. Do some reality check right now. Is there a yoke for your life that shouldn't be there? Is there a burden, in other words, because yokes are burdensome? Is there a weight on your heart, a situation that you just bothers you again and again? Is there someone or something or a situation that it's been created and it's, it's become a yoke and a burdensome. You come to church, you go to church, but it's still there. That means you failed to take his yoke and you failed to enter the rest of God. Are there things that so easily just stress you up? Fear, anxieties, concerns. Are there any yokes? Upon your life that are just bogging you down and slowing you down? Are there any things in your life that are just causing you to lag behind and not walk the walk that God has for you? Are there any yokes in yourself where you have yoked yourself with an unbelieving situation? Because the Bible clearly says, do not yoke yourself to an unbeliever because there is no matching in that. They cannot walk together. In the Old Testament it said, never yoke a donkey with an ox. Because neither does the donkey carry the same load, nor can it go at the same speed as the ox. One interesting thing about the yoke. When the ox are yoked together, the oxen, there is a senior ox and a junior ox. They might look the same in size, by the way. Do your research on this. But there's always a senior ox who carries and draws the junior ox together. Amen. This is why Jesus said, take my yoke. Because I know what you need to do. I understand exactly what needs to happen in your situation. Amen. I know exactly the walk that we've got to take, the route we've got to take, the way we're going to work this situation out. I know exactly how it needs to happen. And unless you are yoked together with me, you are not going to do it. You won't rest, come. Come, let me take you. Let me hold your hands and show you how it is done. Amen. That's the way it is, it is sorted out. Not by using my own mindset, not by using my own schemes, not by using what I can do, but what God wants me to do in this situation. Amen. And that is what needs to be yoked together with Him. So He can pull the weight. He's going to do most of the work. That's what the senior oak did. He did most of the work. And the junior just followed the footsteps of the senior. Hallelujah. That's where we need to be at. Would you please stand with me this morning? Maybe you are here in this place. Maybe you are here in this place. And maybe your body is at rest today. Maybe this concept of having rest and concept of having rest for eternity, that is to, to be in heaven, is, is foreign for you. Maybe you never heard this. Is there even an eternity? Maybe you have some idea. I'm talking to someone particularly here who may not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today. You may not be sure that you are even going to go to heaven and have that eternal rest. My friend, Christ 
wants to give you that eternal rest. Amen. Christ wants to give you that salvation. And you can find that spiritual rest. But for the rest of us, I really want you to right now, give yourself a reality check this morning with me. Be humble, be open. And ask yourself one question. Am I at rest this morning? Am I at rest spiritually? Am I at rest in my soul? Am I at rest in my emotions? Is there stress engulfing my life? Are there enemies that I'm constantly battling and I just can't win? Are there situations in my life that are just so overwhelming me that I just can't? cope with it anymore, that even the very Christian life, that walk that I need to walk is burdensome and it's a struggle to be a Christian and to be a holy person in Christ. Is there sin, is there, is there anything that is putting burden and yokes upon yourself? Then I want to tell you this, that Christ wants to take away every yoke from yourself today. He wants to give you rest from all your enemies. You've been coming to church. But things are still there. See the biggest mistake we make is that. We come to get rest. And we want to leave things at the feet of Jesus. But when Monday strikes. We take the situation back in our control. When you give him the yoke, you give him the yoke. When you give him, you give it to him. You don't concern yourself with it. And if that is you, then I want to invite you forward. I'm going to ask the ministry team to just join together in faith with you. And we're going to pray. One thing we can never do is give our burdens to others because it's Christ's job. Leaders, can I just speak to you and even the worship team behind me? Can I just say this to, to all the leaders in Holy Nation Church, pastors and leaders? Can we please talk like Jesus? I want to be Jesus. Yes, I want to be like him, but I can't carry anyone's burden. The first questions as leaders we should always ask our people, have you prayed about this situation? Before I give you advice, have you sought the Lord? Have you taken this in prayer? Have you casted your burdens upon Jesus Christ? Because He cares for you, not me. Yes, of course we care, but He cares more than I care. And He's got the solution better and far more superior than I can give you or any leader can give you. If we don't point people in the right direction, they are never, ever going to be free. And people, I want to speak to you as well. Congregation of Holy Nation Church. Your home group leaders can't carry your burdens. Your pastors can't carry your burden. Because it's Jesus who wants to carry it. And he's already done it. All the way to Calcutta. He's already done it with that thick wooden cross upon his shoulders. It is him we seek today. Not anyone's touch, but the touch of the Savior. You want to worship with this song. If you want to come here and leave your burdens at the feet of Jesus, do it. Somebody may lay hands upon you and bless you. But come. Do not walk out of this place today without doing business with God. Amen. He wants to carry your burdens. He wants to set you free. The Bible says anointing breaks the yoke, but the anointed one is here in this place. And he wants to break every yoke, every enemy. He wants to give you rest from his present right now in this place. And he wants to set you free. Now the choice is yours. You want to come to him, come to him and leave it at his feet and walk out of this place free from every burden every anxiety, every stress, every condemnation, every guilt, and walk into his freedom in the name of Jesus today. Hallelujah. Let us sing. Let us sing and worship.
Come to Him.